Hello, my name is Gemma Williams and this is my second video that I am making and it was my second presentation that I've given at an international linguistics conference as part of my PhD at the University of Brighton. So I'm making these videos and sharing them online because I think, I believe it's uh, really important to make uh, research uh, within the field of autism as accessible as possible to those individuals um, for whom it's most relevant, so uh, autistic people. Um, so process improvement, um, in this second video I am indoors, so hopefully the sound quality will be a bit better, although I am on a boat uh, and there's a lot of creaking at the moment, um, so I hope that's not too disruptive. Um, I will be writing a lay summary and including that in the video description because this presentation was written to be given at a linguistics conference so it includes uh, some technical terms uh, which might make it not that accessible to people who aren't trained in this field so I'll be providing that in the description and I will also type up uh, some subtitles as well to help with the sound quality or for anyone who would like to use them. So this uh, presentation was given at the 8th International Conference on Intercultural Pragmatics and Communication at the University of Cyprus um, a week ago, so the 8th to 10th of June 2018. So as I've said, it's um, my first year of my PhD. Um, so my main aim of this presentation was to share the ideas that I'm working on at the moment and get any feedback. So if anyone watching would like to get in touch, comment, um, get involved in the discussion, give me feedback, brilliant. My contact details will be at the end on the final slide. Um, so first of all, I will um, explore the notion of theory of mind and try to tease out some of the assumptions that underpin it. I'll then outline some alternative theories addressing the pragmatic difficulties seen in autism and talk about how that relates to autistic language research. Um, and finally, um, the, the part that I'm most interested in and the work that I'm, that I'm doing, I'll explore whether mutual manifestness uh, can be a useful framework um, for understanding these difficulties and differences. There are a couple of slides that include similar content to my other video. Hopefully um, it will be a little bit different, but feel free to skip to the next slide if you have seen it already. So um, terminology I'll be using, I will use the word neurotypical. It's from, um, it's taken from the neurodiversity movement. Uh, there's a great TED talk by Steve Silberman, if you are unfamiliar with this and would like to find out more. Um, and it refers to non-autistic people. Um, so I'll be using this term to refer to people who aren't autistic. And secondly, um, it's been found in several studies, including by Kenny et al, 2016, that autistic people I tend to prefer identity first language, i.e. They, um, they prefer autistic person rather than person with autism, person with disabilities, etc. Um, so I'm using that uh, in this talk and I have been using it at the conferences to try and redress the balance. And actually it was really heartening um, in Cyprus to see that uh, all of the questions I received afterwards from uh, linguistics academics used the uh, person identity first language. Um, okay, again, um, you may have seen this slide. I'm referring to um, in this talk, I'll be referring to individuals who use language to communicate the majority of the time. So they may have um, some idiosyncrasies and often have a life pattern of. Um, interpersonal misunderstandings. Um, they previously 
may have been referred to as high functioning or having Asperger's, um, but both of these terms are kind of falling out of use. Um, and there's growing recognition that uh, functioning labels aren't really appropriate because it's not, there isn't a linear scale of functioning ability. It's much more um, of a spectrum. Uh, as you can see on the screen, um, there's an image taken from Rebecca Burgess's blog, um, giving a nice image of um, the constellation of traits that you um, can find in autism. Okay, so theory of mind um, is understood to be the ability to perspective take of oneself and of others. It's widely accepted as a fundamental aspect of human social cognition and is a central feature of ostensive inferential communication. In 1990, um, Simon Baron Cohen coined the term mind blindness to describe what he theorised was a cognitive deficit in autistic individuals resulting in the inability to detect or make sense of the states of others. Um, I consider there to be several issues with this theory. Um, firstly, uh, the primary research tools that we used. Um, you may or may not be aware of um, the Salian task or false belief task. These are uh, now quite famous uh, measures of theory of mind. Um, typically, um, you'll have ch child participants and there will be um, a scene unfolding in front of them. And in this scene, um, one character, let's call her Sally, comes in. She has a special toy. She puts it away in a box um, and she leaves the room. And then a new character comes in and she opens the box, removes the toy, hides it somewhere else, um, leaves the room. And then Sally returns and the child is asked, where will Sally look for the toy? And the, the rationale behind this um, experiment is that if the child is able to meta represent the representations of others, the child, child will know that Sally um, won't know that the, the toy has been moved. Um, the problem um, with this, this tool is that um, it relies on uh, participants' linguistic abilities. Um, so autistic children are not the only ones to have failed these tests. Uh, blind children, deaf children and uh, mentally impaired children have also failed, as well as children with specific language impairments um, whose cognitive skills are otherwise normal. normal. So when linguistic ability is controlled for, uh, differences in uh, theory of mind performance disappear. Secondly, the second issue, um, in the original Simon Baron Cohen study, um, it featured preschool age children, um, and so have virtually uh, all of the follow up um, studies, or certainly the majority of them. Um, and this is probably based on the fact that by this age, preschool age, uh, neurotypical children already pass a false belief test. Um, it's also worth noting that in the original study, 20% of autistic children also passed the false belief test, which is a kind of uh, inconvenient fact, really. So, um, crucially, these studies have been cross-sectional um, in the sense that they're comparing age-matched participant groups. Um, Peterson and Wellman have just published a study a couple of months ago um, reporting on their longitudinal cross-sequential study of theory of mind um, and they compared uh, neurotypical autistic and deaf children across a year and a half the same children over a year and a half 
These children were aged between 3 and 11, with a mean age of around 7.5 years. Um, in order to complete this study, they devised a, an extended six-step theory of mind scale as a test measure. So um, they've added a discrete measure, uh, the sixth one in this list, um, dealing with uh, the ability to understand sarcasm. Um, and the reason for adding this was to mitigate ceiling performance um, of those children who will have uh, developed as far as the standard five point scale would be able to measure to. So they found that uh, most autistic children, like their neurotypical and deaf peers, do continue to make substantial longitudinal theory of mind progress throughout the school years. Um, so they may not, uh, or they weren't reaching the same level by the same at the same age as their neurotypical peers, but they showed steady individual progress. So given the appropriate environmental stimulation, um, I, I don't think it's impossible to imagine that um, eventually by adulthood or adolescence, autistic children might catch up to uh, the same level of their neurotypical peers. But of course, this hasn't really been measured yet. Um, Incidentally, and interestingly, they also found that there was an atypical sequence of theory of mind stage progression in autistic children. So this um, list, the six point scale on the slide, um, relates to the stages that neurotypical children progress through. They acquire one by one in that order. Um, and they found... go back. They found that autistic children um, develop uh, the ability to recognise hidden emotions prior to uh, the ability to um, recognise false beliefs, that those things that are measured in the Sally Ann task. Um, so i.e. at the stage when neurotypical children are acquiring the ability to represent another's representation, and work out that the belief another, another holds is false. Autistic children instead are developing the ability to understand that underlying emotions can be hidden um, and, and not match what is expressed outwardly. So this acquisitional sequence difference calls into question the valid validity of false belief tests as a reliable cross-sequential measure. I skipped this uh, page in the talk, so I will as well. Okay. Um, if you've seen uh, the other video, this is uh, similar material in the slide. So there has been uh, some recent research that's beginning to provide evidence of the difficulties that neurotypicals have um, understanding autistic people too. So this includes recent evidence of non-autistic people's difficulties judging autistic people's facial expressions, um, difficulties interpreting the behaviour of autistic people, and a reduced willingness to interact with autistic people based on unfavourable first impression judgments. So in the case of this study, uh, the biases, uh, the, the immediate uh, negative first impressions that the uh, neurotypical um, participants formed in relation to um, the autistic people that they uh, were asked to rate. Um, those biases occurred um, even when just a photograph was presented of an autistic person without the diagnosis given um, and mixed with photographs of neurotypical people. Um, but that bias wasn't present when uh, the raters were given transcripts of autistic speech. So uh, this again, I think, uh, 
calls into question this idea that there's something inherently problematic about autistic speech, it, it seems to be a bigger picture. Um, and um, again, you might be familiar with this, um, so based on his intuitions and anecdotal evidence from the autistic uh, community or autistic adults, um, Damien Milton is an autistic autism scholar from the UK. He um, proposed the double empathy problem, which he uh, characterises as a disjuncture in reciprocity between the two differently disposed social actors. Um, so according to the double empathy problem, misunderstanding um, is not a consequence of autistic impairment, it's a mutual, a mutual problem. Um, and using the double empathy problem, uh, Brett Heisman and Alex Gillespie of the London School of Economics um, explored how um, this might be measured in terms of understanding and misunderstandings between autistic individuals and their family members. Um, you, so there's a link, hopefully you can see um, on the slide, that links to a video, an animation that Brett Heisman made um, describing this study, uh, which I highly recommend if you haven't seen it. Um, so um, they used an adapted framework um, from Lang's 1966 IPM model of intersubjective perspective taking, um, and this is what we have in the image here. Um, so, both the autistic person and their family member were asked to rate themselves and the other, and the other's predicted rating of self in relation to 12 different topics, such as, um, you know, kind of personality traits or um, ability to socialise, that kind of thing. Um, and they found that autistic people were able to accurately predict their family members' low ratings of them, despite disagreeing with a view. So, for example, if uh, the question was how good are you at socialising, an autistic person may have rated themselves 5 out of 10, the family member may have rated them, the autistic person, as 2 out of 10. So there's a disagreement, um, but the autistic person would have accurately predicted that their family member would rate them two out of ten despite not agreeing with it. So this shows um, that um, uh, autistic people have a much greater potential for perspective taking than we previously thought. So coming to autistic language use, uh, Dinashak and Akhtar in 2013 argued that mind blindness as a metaphor um, originally coined by Simon Van Cohen not only obscures the fact that both parties uh, contribute to the social and communicative difficulties between them in the same line as the double empathy problem, but it also contributes to overlooking the ways in which autistic behaviours can be meaningful and or adaptive. So the prevailing notion that autistic people lack theory of mind can lead neurotypicals to uh, neurotypical interlocutors to assuming a lack of meaning in the behaviour and utterances of these individuals and simply overlooking it. Um, Stoponi and de Kirby in the 2016 multidimensional reappraisal of language and autism uh, share this theme and I highly recommend this paper. Um, they have a really interesting approach. They uh, take an ethnographic discourse analytic approach um, that takes into account an utterance's interactional accomplishment as well as its propositional content. Um, and they applied this to a small corpus of um, naturalistic communication between young autistic children and familiar neurotypical adults. So traditionally, um, features associated with autistic speech, uh, particularly in children, but not always, um, such as pronoun atypicality, uh, referring to oneself um, by, in the third person, he or she, rather than I, 
um, echolalia, repetition of words or sounds out of context or apparently out of context, um, and pragmatically atypical, atypical utterances um, have all been taken as direct manifestations of deficits. Um, but they found that um, when, when this corpus was uh, analysed, taking into account the interactional accomplishments as well, that um, these prototypical features can often have hidden communicative purposes. Um, so, uh, and they can, and they might conceal competences and interactional processes that have been largely invisible in mainstream research so far. So, for example, uh, third-person pronoun use for self um, could be an example of adopting the baby talk framework of the interlocutor, uh, come to daddy, give mummy a cuddle, and echolalia uh, had several different functional purposes um, and also um, could be seen as a form of perspective taking. So having established that uh, a lack of theory of mind may not be a robust enough theory to explain differences and difficulties seen in um, autistic language use, I'd like to turn to relevance theory to see if it can shed some new light. But before um, we look at how relevance theory might help us, uh, we need first of all to understand why it can. So uh, Nagel famously asked, what's it like to be a bat? And concluded that it is unknowable on account of the chasm of perceptual differences informing the human and bat subjectivity. Um, he, he decided that uh, bat sonar, though clearly a form of perception, is not similar in its operation to any sense that we possess. And there is no reason to suppose that it is subjectively like anything we can experience or imagine. This appears to create difficulties for the notion of what is it like to be a bat. Uh, autism is characterised by perceptual and attentional differences that are present from birth. Um, and as we know, sensory information um, forms the building blocks for higher order cognitive and social functions. I've taken this diagram from Baumetal, 2015, um, just indicating how um, our, the, the way in which we process sensory information, you know, is, is a foundation, foundational aspect in um, how we build our perceptual and cognitive. Uh, abilities. So it makes sense to me that, um, that this would affect what is salient and how representations are organised in the mind and feed back in an iterative interactional loop, particularly if you follow uh, a neuroconstructivist view where the environment influences gene expression and brain development, um, which of course, then influences how you're perceiving your environment ad infinitum. So certainly for a simulationist perspective of theory of mind, um, you could argue that theory of mind functions best when the similarities between the two minds are greatest. Um, the ability to work out how another works relies on us knowing how we work. And from a theory theory perspective, what matters, I think, is how greatly the encountered mind differs from uh, the minds and the representation sets uh, of an individual's culture. So relevant theory, um, a cognitive is a cognitive account of utterance interpretation and it has central to it this notion of mutual manifestness. So 
So an individual is seen to have their own cognitive environment, which includes all facts and assumptions potentially available to an individual. Um, and it's the outcome of a worldly environment and an individual's cognitive abilities to a greater or lesser degree. So for example, I may not have it stored representationally that the Queen of England has never taken a ride on a narwhal. But, you know, maybe I've never thought about that before. But should it come up over a beer or two, over dinner, um, I'm able to generate this assumption. It's accessible to me, therefore, uh, within this framework, it's manifest. So it, 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 it exists within my cognitive environment. It's not at the fore of my mind, but I'm able to generate the assumption um, using what I have available to me. So mutual manifestness, I can't quite move my, my head out of the way, sorry, um, is where cognitive environments overlap. Um, and crucially, where speakers uh, recognise this, that's what it says above my head, or speakers are aware of this. So if it's something to be mutually manifest, it needs to exist in two individuals' cognitive environments and both individuals be aware that it's a shared representation. So I've tried to create a visual depiction of mutual manifestness. Um, it's very basic. This is um, an, one individual's cognitive environment, a circle. And here, um, two, uh, two cognitive environments overlapping partially. Um, and what's shared, what's in the middle, is uh, what's mutually manifest. Of course, uh, these two circles will be uh, move further apart and closer together, depending on a huge amount of factors and also, it de de depending on context, the same two individuals might have different things mutually manifest at different times. Um, but this is just to give a kind of something to compare to, um, because here I've, I've copied the picture from the previous slide, and it's now labelled neurotypical to neurotypical. Um, two sets of cognitive environments overlapping, uh, contrasting to what I propose, um, a neurotypical, uh, an individual's cognitive environment, an autistic individual's cognitive environment. I've coloured it differently and I've skewed it at a different angle to try and indicate um, this kind of marked difference in, um, in, in representations, I suppose, and in cognitive environment based on uh, the sensory, perceptual, attentional differences that uh, present from birth and continue to scaffold in, in different traje trajectories. I can't say that word. Love that word. I can't say it. So, sorry, before my closing thoughts, um, perceptual and representational differences create more markedly different cognitive environments uh, with less actually shared. However, these differences um, are not visible. Autistic people don't have big batteries. Um, so not only are these differences uh, invisible, but they're also arguably impossible, um, or certainly very difficult to predict or imagine on account of their qualitative differences. So um, it seems plausible to me that there will be assumptions made, uh, certainly on the part of uh, the neurotypical interlocutors, um, assuming that uh, utterances or propositions are mutually manifest uh, with, with an autistic interlocutor, when in fact they're not. Um, and, and both uh, speakers could be making these assumptions that things are shared, that things are mutually manifest, when in fact they're not at all. Um, okay, so um, my closing thoughts um, or questions really. Um, what does all of this mean, uh, particularly the start of the presentation? Um, what does it mean for how we design research methods in the future um, when it comes to autistic language, communication? How can we make sense 
of the results from previous experiments based on assumptions relating to theory of mind that are now questionable. And can relevant theory and the notion of mutual manifestness help us make sense of communication difficulties in autism? I think so, um, but I would like to try and investigate that further. So thank you very much for your time. Um, that's it. Do get in touch if you'd like to and keep on keeping on. Bye.